Our reading from the epistles comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 18 to 31. This is the primary passage from which the morning message will come as well. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, Think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Well, as you all know by now, Ruth and I returned from a week in the Southern California desert. What a place to be. Just before I left on that trip, I picked up a book, a book by Jonathan Kahn called The Book of Mysteries. Yeah. It's a novel, in a sense, but it reveals the truth. And it begins when a man, a traveler, encounters a teacher in the desert. And that teacher shows him truths and reveals mysteries over a process of time. And I thought, what a unique thing that I start reading this book just when we're heading out to the desert. And in fact, I did read that book along with my Bible and other good books during the time that we were there. It was absolutely fantastic to see the, uh, the high desert, the rocks, the mountains, the, uh, the cacti, the Joshua trees, oh yeah, fantastic stuff. Actually, the, uh, the desert in Southern California is very similar to the desert in Southern Israel, where people like John the Baptist ministered, where Jesus would go to spend time in prayer and to meet with his Heavenly Father. We had an opportunity to... Uh, go to church last Sunday morning at the Gateway Community Church where I was lead pastor years ago. And uh, just a handful of people who were there back then in the 80s. It's amazing how congregations change over time and communities change too. In fact, the majority of the congregation there now was Korean background. Mm. Had a good time worshiping with those folks. And in the afternoon, we went and spent time with Cal and Pat Mori. Cal was my associate pastor when we were there in Chino. He's 84 years old now, still working hard at his furniture refinishing business, serving the Lord, and still totally on fire for Jesus. It was really exciting to see. We stayed in the desert, in a little house, out removed from the city a long way. We reached it by traveling over a very rough, 
rocky, dusty, desert track. The first couple times we went there, we did so in the dark, and we actually wandered around the desert for a while before we found the place. Kind of at the end of the road, up on a hill. It was set up in such a way that there were glass windows facing toward the east. And when the sun came up at 6 o'clock in the morning, if you were still in bed, you could watch the sunrise without even raising your head. It was pretty sweet. First, it was just a faint glow, and then you could see the line of the mountains outlined. And then, as the sun came up, you'd see the colors in the sky, and then the floor of the desert would be revealed. Great big boulders down below us including one that was shaped exactly like a football. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, Super Bowl is coming. God's football is more super. It was beautiful, it was majestic, it was awesome, and I thought, how much more beautiful, majestic, and awesome is the one who created all of this. I had a fantastic time with my wife, hiking in the desert. I was so grateful that she was able to do that the first day we were there. We went with somebody who knew the desert well and hiked all day and she was able to do that. I remember the last time we were in the desert two years ago when she could hardly walk and had to sit down and wait and now her heart has been mended and we thank God for that. And I had some great opportunities to ride a motorcycle. Uh -oh. One of the most yeah. spiritual things you can do. Oh. <laughs> it's a great way to pray. Especially, you learn to pray with your eyes open. It was, uh, it was terrific. Uh, there's so much beauty to see in God's world. Uh, and like I said, I also really benefited by, by good books, and I, and I do want to acknowledge that some of what I want to share with you this morning was inspired by what I read in Jonathan Kahn's book. Today I want to talk to you about love. By the way, the desert's a great place to get away with your wife. <coughs> Just saying, while we're talking about love. But I want to talk about love. What is love? One answer to that would be, love is wanting what is best for another. God loves you. And God wants what is best for you. The Bible declares that God is love. If God is love, then he must be the ultimate love, the greatest love of all. The greatest love in the universe has already been manifested right here on our planet, Earth, the rock from the side. The Bible says, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. That's John 15, 13. So, if God is ultimate love, the greatest love of all, that is what he would do. Lay down his life. In fact, that is what God did. He put himself in our place. God the Son died in our place on the cross. There is no greater love that you could ever know. The cross is the symbol of the greatest love of all. Now, whether you feel it or not, doesn't change a thing. Nothing you can do can change the love of God for you. We cannot change God's love for us. We can only accept it and be changed by it. 1 Corinthians 1.23, we read it just a moment ago, contains this phrase. We preach Christ crucified. And that's what we do here at DCC. We preach Christ crucified. 
The death of Jesus on the cross stands as the greatest act of sacrificial love in the history of the world. And yet, and yet multitudes of people in this world just don't get it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. In ancient times, the people of God were called the Hebrews. Hebrews is another name for the Israelites or the Jews. Do you know what the word Hebrew means? It comes from a root word that means to cross over. The Hebrews are those who cross over a barrier. In order to leave Egypt, the Hebrews had to cross over the Red Sea. In order to enter the Promised Land, they had to cross over the Jordan River. They had been slaves in Egypt. They had to pass over a barrier in order to begin a new life of freedom. The Hebrews are the crossover people. Those who leave one land to go to another. Those who leave one life to begin another. But the ancient Hebrews are not the only Hebrews. The Bible teaches that all the followers of the Hebrew Messiah, Jesus, are joined together with Israel. If you are a Jesus follower, a disciple of Jesus, you are a spiritual Hebrew. In order to become a spiritual Hebrew, you must pass through a barrier. In order to begin a new life with God, you must come by way of the cross. To some, this is a stumbling block. And to some, it sounds like foolishness, according to 1 Corinthians 1, 21. But it is the only way to begin a new life with God. If you want to approach God, you have to come to Him on His terms. There is no other way. The only way to be born again is the way of the cross. Jesus said, unless a person is born again, they cannot enter the kingdom of God. That's John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus is the one who broke the ultimate barrier. He crossed from death to life. After the crucifixion came the resurrection. Jesus came back to life again. Because he lives, you too can live a new life. You were called to cross from death to life. From darkness to light, from slavery to freedom, from the kingdom of this world to the kingdom of God, our Father. Before you were born again, the cross appears as a barrier that keeps you from coming to God. But it is actually not a barrier. It is actually the doorway, the portal by which you may enter another realm the kingdom of our Father. On the night that the Hebrews left Egypt, they were told to put the blood of the Passover lamb on the wood beams of their doorways. They took the blood of that lamb and they smeared it across the top of the door and down the sides of that door and then they went through that blood-stained door and stayed inside their homes while the angel of death passed over. And the next time they came through that blood-stained doorway was the last time they came through that doorway. When they passed through that doorway again, it was for the very last time. It would be to leave their old life. 
their slavery, their bondage. It would be the beginning of a new life, a new identity, and ultimately a new home in a new land. It was the blood of the Lamb that transformed those doorways into a portal through which they could leave their old world and enter the new. Centuries later would come another Passover, another portal, another lamb. That lamb was Jesus. Do you remember what John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus? He said, look, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1 and 29. It was only a few years later that Jesus died, willingly shedding his blood on the cross. What was that cross made of? Wood beams. Beams of wood marked by the blood of God's sacrificial lamb. So what is the cross? It is not just an instrument of death, but a doorway to life. The wooden beams of the cross, marked by the blood of the Lamb, are the doorway to a new realm of existence, the kingdom of God. The only way you can really know it is to experience it. You need to experience it personally. You must be born again. If you are not sure that you are born again, you need to be. Cross over today by way of the cross of Jesus. You can do it now, right this minute. God's love is the greatest love of all. He loves you so much. He would die to save you. In fact, that's exactly what he did. Place your faith in the crucified and resurrected Lamb of God, Jesus the Messiah. Do it now. Today is the day of salvation. None of us has any assurance of tomorrow. Each of us is only one heartbeat away from eternity. We never know when that last heartbeat will come. If you are not sure that you were born again, or if you have fallen away from God, I invite you to pray this prayer after me. You can join me right now in praying this prayer. I come to you now. I open my life to you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for me. Forgive me. Cleanse me. I am turning from my sin and turning to you. I receive your cleansing and your love. You are my God. I am your disciple. Your spirit is now in my life. I am born again. I am blessed. I am free. Fill me. Use me. In the name of Messiah Jesus. Amen. The Bible says if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you prayed that prayer today, if you prayed it from your heart sincerely, God is faithful, and He is just, and He forgives your sin, and makes you His child. If you prayed that prayer today, either as a new prayer or as a renewal of your commitment to God, I'd like to invite you just to raise your hand. All right, yes, I see hands coming up all over the place all over the place. If you have made that commitment new today, and you're
you're starting a new journey with God, uh, come and see me afterwards. I'd like to give you, if you would like to have it, a gift from the church of a New Testament, the story of Jesus and his love. Let's sing our closing song, shall we? Let's sing it from our hearts. <coughs>